It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing the man, the legend, Dr. <laughs> Gary Glassman, who <laughs> graced us by putting an online CE course on Dental Town this summer called the Endodontic Restorative Continuum, a blueprint for success. Dr. Gary Glassman, his website is drgaryglassman.com. That's glass, just G-L-A-S-S, and man, not glass, the man. It's glassman.com. <laughs> We are both lecturing today in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, they have, um, this was the 24th annual Malaysian Dental Convention. And he is so sweet after, I said, I know you don't wanna do this, but after a long day of lecturing, is there any chance at the end of your seminar uh, you would do a podcast interview with my homies? And he said, absolutely. Thank you so much. Sure, my pleasure. For coming on my show. Finally meet you in person. And. Uh, I don't want I don't want to call us old, but you've been doing root canals longer than most of these guys have been alive. Unbelievable! You've, you've been doing how many years? You've been doing root canals. Thirty years. So I, I want to start with just a, a couple of questions. One, one of one of the problems I have, you know, I, I want them to do dentistry faster, easier, better, higher quality, but they're coming out of school three hundred fifty thousand dollars in student loans. And Ryan and I are in you know a dozen dental schools every year. And half the class walks out and says, Howard, I hate endo. I don't want to do endo. The problem with that is half of these people go to rural America where there's no endodontist, the person has a toothache. And when you have $350,000 of student loans, you have to do a lot of things you don't like. And if, if I'm trying to sell you veneers, I gotta be a salesman. Well, they, they're not salesmen. But if I come in with a toothache, that's a pretty easy sell. They're coming in saying, I am in pain and I hurt. What would you say? I know you got two daughters and a son, about the age of my children. Absolutely. What would you do if your daughter was 25, just walked out of school, $350,000 student loan, she said, Dad, I hate endo. Take a good course and learn how to do it. Start off with the easy stuff first because once you get the easy stuff, you get good at it, and then speed will come. And that's one of the biggest frustrations with endo is you're working in a dark hole, you can't see what you're doing, and it gets very frustrating. So starting off with the easy cases, doing them well, will allow you to do the more difficult cases and of course the more lucrative cases, indeed. Because you know you start doing molar endodontics, especially when you're in a rural America or rural Canada, you gotta be doing it. Especially when you're in debt for $350,000. That's a lot of dough, man. It's a lot of root canals that you gotta do and a lot of veneers and a lot of crowns. So I say take good courses, take good CE courses, start off slow, do it well, and the money will come. Great advice. Another question they're always asking is, um, they go to these big dental conventions, and there's so many file systems, then it's kind of overwhelming and confusing, and they basically think to themselves, I already, um, I'm not good at endo. The last thing I want to do is have the wrong system. What would you What would you say to her if she said, "What file would you use?" Yeah, it's mind-boggling the amount of file systems that are on the market to shape canals. You know, there's so many different types and there's so many different ways of doing it, and the marketing is incredible by the different companies. You know, whatever you're comfortable with in school, continue that if you're comfortable with it. If you're not, go to a CE course and find out what means you can use to achieve the end properly that will do it simply for you and you don't need to spend a ton of dough either there's all kinds of file systems on the market that don't cost a lot of money but it's just a different means to the same end so choose something that go to a ce course and stick with one file system and whatever file system it happens to be is there do you have any favorites of course i lecture for Kerr endodontics so my favorite is the twisted file i like the twisted file because i like the metallurgy I like TF Adaptive. The adaptive motor is a hybrid between rotary and reciprocation. So it rotates in the canal, but once it encounters torque in the canal, it starts to reciprocate. Probably the safest motor, in my opinion, on the market. And what's it called? It's called the Elements Motor. Elements? Elements Motor by Kerr Endo. And the system is called TF Adaptive. TF adapter. TF adapter. What, 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 what does that stand for? TF adapter. Twisted file. Twisted file. See, the files are manual. Isn't there a band called Twisted Sister? Twisted or? Sister, exactly. Was, was there Twisted Sister? So I just say, get twisted. <laughs> yeah. was, was, was the band an influence on the. <laughs> twisted Sisters. I don't know. It should be a sponsor for it, right? Yeah. Probably sell a lot more. 
Yeah, so the Twisted file is manufactured completely differently than any other file. Most file systems are ground in a lathe. And this Twisted file is heat treated, and then it's actually twisted. And so it twisted along the natural grain structure of the actual file. And there's no lathe marks in it, so there's no micro fractures that occur in it. So it can't, you know, propagate into the center and, and break like a lot of ground files do. When you and I got out of school, the files were stainless steel. Absolutely. Remember those? Sure, still and use them. And I tell you, you still use them? Of course. For, for what? Well, we got to create the pathway before we use our nickel titanium files. So we got to get past the calcifications, got to get past the ledges, got to get past the blockages. So we start off our root canal with stainless steel files to create the glide path or the pathway from the orifice down to the apical terminus. And then, and only then, can we use our nickel titanium files to follow whatever system you decide to use. So a lot, a lot of the questions on downtown that confuse them is like, um, okay, so this crown, okay, so the, the, the molar has, um, it's symptomatic, it needs a root canal. It has a crown on there. And sometimes they see older dentists drilling a hole through the top and mm -hmm. doing a crown. But a lot of them are asking on dental town, well, wouldn't the bacteria be coming in from around the crown? Wouldn't it be better to take the old crown off? Isn't, aren't the ants getting into <laughs> there? Aren't the ants and termites getting in somewhere around that crown? The bugs can get in through the margins, absolutely. And, and I believe, and a lot of my colleagues believe also, once you make access through a crown, you're disturbing that seal. So I have colleagues that will say, I'm taking the crown off, Gary. We're gonna temporize it for you. When they come to your office, you slip off the crown, do your root canal, put the temporary crown back on, and I'll redo the crown. But you know what? New crowns cost a lot of dough, and a lot of patients don't wanna spend the extra dough for the crown. We try to tell them and impart on them that in an ideal world, best treatment, get a new crown once that root canal treatment's done. But if it costs a lot of dough, they wanna just have the access to the crown, get it restored. Some of them will just take their chances. You know, depending on when the crown was done, if the crown was done two days ago and now all of a sudden they have a irreversible pulpitis, then the crown may be okay. It may be okay. So you drill through it, you tell the patient, the porcelain may fracture off and the tooth is restored as best as possible. But yes, I do agree with you. The ants are getting in somewhere and we wanna prevent them from getting in after the root canal treatment because probably one of the biggest reasons why root canal treatments may not work or fail is due to coronal leakage. And we need to restore that tooth. And we need to make sure that we get good marginal integrity, of course. Another question, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, there's 50 forums on Dentaltown. There's a quarter million members. They've, they've posted five and a half million times. So I'm on the endo section, just ripping through the most common questions. Wow. A very big common question they have is, there's an MOD amalgam. Um, the tooth is hurting and symptomatic needs to work now. They take out that MOD amalgam mm -hmm. and then they see a black line. And they're just like, oh my God. So they take a picture, they post on Dental Town. What do, you, what do you do when you're doing a root canal and you take out the MOD amalgam and there's a black, I mean, Stevie Wonder could see this black line. Right, you see that crack line in that tooth. Well, cracks come in many shapes and sizes. <laughs> they certainly do. And a lot of times the tooth, if there's a pocket adjacent to that crack like a long thin pocket take the tooth out because the chances are it's a vertical root fracture if it's a crack that's a fresh crack and it's a vital pulp and you probe really firmly and you can't probe along it I'll say let's do the treatment and try to save that tooth telling the patient about cracks and I usually use the analogy of a crack in a windshield of a car usually starts off with a hard impact could have been an unpopped popcorn kernel could have been a hard candy, could have been a nut, could have been an ice cube. And that crack can propagate just like the crack at a windshield of a car, just by eating and chewing, bruxism, hot and cold expansion. So I'll tell my patients, crack teeth present probably the grayest area in, in dentistry, certainly in endodontics, because often they're difficult to diagnose, difficult to assess the prognosis long-term as far as what's gonna happen. And I tell my patients, the prognosis of crack teeth is somewhat guarded long term. You could have it for the rest of your life, you could have it till next week. You decide what you'd like to do. If it was my tooth in this particular situation, I would treat it. And in other situations, I would say, take it out, replace it with an implant. I, I wanna ask you a moral ethical question since you're a Canadian. 
How can <laughs> how can your favorite sport be hockey, which and be an endodontist when you know hockey pucks destroy more teeth than all the other sports combined? It's interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting question. Is I see a lot of professional hockey players from the Toronto Maple Leafs from yesteryear. You know all the old greats and. Uh, I'd say about 95% of them are missing their <laughs> centrals and their laterals and they got their canines. <laughs> yep. And, uh, you know, very, very common to see, as I'm sure you have too. I had one, I can't mention his name because of privacy, but uh, he would let me mention his name, but he was a, uh, an old timer, was one of the captains of the Toronto Maple Leafs and he came in and he, I said, I, I, you got all your front teeth. I go, this is amazing. I think I did root canal on one of his upper first molars. And I said, man, this is unbelievable. I've never seen a professional hockey player <laughs> with all his four front teeth. And he just said one thing. He said, Tiger Williams. I go, Tiger Williams? He says, yep, wouldn't let anyone get near me. He was one of the enforcers for the Toronto Maple Leafs a long time ago. Wouldn't let anyone get near me. That's how I survived. Amazing. Had all his teeth. So I'm in Phoenix. We have the Phoenix Coyotes. Sure who are building a brand new stadium right by my house. I mean, it's literally 10 minutes from my house. I'm so excited. And it's so funny because during a game, whenever they're panning the bench, they're all missing all their teeth. And then when the game's over there at a press conference, they all have their <coughs> partials in it. Sure. all pretty and have teeth. Um, I want to I wanna throw my, my older homies. They're, most of the audience you're talking to is 30 and under, but we get emails every day that say, hey, I'm a, I'm a 55-year-old guy in Texas. I listen to your show and all that stuff. But... A lot of the young kids complain that they go get a job for an, an older guy our age and they're an associate and after every root canal in Parsons, Kansas to Texas, every patient gets Penn VK and 16 Vicodin 500. Wow. And and what what would you tell an older guy listening that says, you know what? And they say to me, I mean, I, you've been out there like, well, it's an insurance policy. You know, I mean, better safe than sorry. Mm -hmm. So I give everybody 28 tabs of 500 pen BKs four times a day until they're all gone after every root canal, after every implant, after every wow. wisdom teeth extraction, and 16 bikes to go with it. Well, what would you say to that? I'd say that's overkill. I'd say that's overkill. I would not recommend antibiotics. There are no studies that say antibiotics are going to be effective, certainly for vital cases. It's not an infected state. Even in infected root canals, the treatment of choice is doing the root canal treatment, getting rid of the inoculum within that root canal system. Antibiotics are recommended for cases where there are systemic symptoms. When the patient has lymphadenopathy, when they're febrile, when they have malaise. Certainly if a patient is immunocompromised, antibiotics are recommended in infected states. Patients are diabetic, especially uncontrolled diabetics. Decreased healing capacity, if the case is non-vital, apical periodontitis, antibiotics are often recommended in those cases. But for the norm, definitely not. As far as Vicodin goes, I would never prescribe a heavy narcotic like that. Certainly a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, as long as the medical history doesn't contraindicate it, often suffices post-operatively for root canal treatment. So let me ask this another way. If you did 100 molar root canals, what percent of those would get antibiotics or a narcotic? Antibiotics, very rarely. Out of 100, how many? Out of 100, maybe three or four okay. out of 100. If they came in, acute apical periodontitis, lymphadenopathy, swelling, definitely would put them on antibiotics. As far as a heavy narcotic like Vicodin, I've never prescribed Vicodin before. I've prescribed Tylenol with codeine Tylenol 3s, and I'll do that probably maybe 20% of the time if they need it. But anti-inflammatories, 100% of the time I'll recommend it. What's your go-to pain med? I like ibuprofen, 600 milligrams, right away, before the anesthesia wears off, as long as their medical history doesn't contraindicate it. Right? There's patients every day on high blood pressure medication where you can't give NSAIDs. Right? So sometimes they tough it out, sometimes I'll prescribe Tylenol recommend Tylenol and I'll give them Tylenol with codeine and say take it if you need it if you don't need it don't take it uh, um, another very confusing thing why, why you know there are a lot of people talking about you know they they do their appointment and want to you know end up when, when I got out of school 
pretty much all Linda was done in two appointments. In the in the 80s, you <clears throat> the first appointment you cleaned it all out and put in some intracanal medication. Then if it was okay, two weeks later you operate it. And but anyway, the the question succinctly is this: Do you have a different one step versus two step protocol if it's irreversible pulpitis, where there's a cavity into the pulp, but there's no periapical versus you take a PA and there's a periapical radiolucency. Do you do endo different if it has a periapical radiolucency versus just a standard? I don't. I don't. I And if you look at the research and you look at the science, there really is no science that said that the outcome is going to be better if you do it in one appointment or two appointments. My protocol is the same. Now, I use an irrigation system called the Endovac, which allows us, works on apical negative pressure. Who, who, who makes that? Kerr Endo now carries it. It was originally a discus dental product. Really? Yeah. What, what's the name of that? It's called the Endovac. So that hooks up to your slow speed suction? It actually hooks up to your high volume suction. The high volume. Right? There's an Endovac adapter with multi ports on it that attaches to clear plastic tubing which attaches to the little hand pieces and it's nothing more than a mini suction system and it's got one system one cannula it's called the micro cannula and it's a long narrow stainless steel hollow tube it's got a diameter of 0.32 millimeters it's got 12 little holes at the tip of it it attaches to a finger piece which attaches to clear plastic tubing to the high volume suction you place it right to working length right to working length and you deliver your sodium hypochlorite to the pulp chamber and through negative pressure it sucks it down right to the apex and sucks it right back out again so you got a few things that are happening number one you don't get any irrigant past the apex number two you get a continuous flow of irrigant right to the apical terminus so you get removal of tissue 100 percent of the time you get removal of the bacteria and Right now on the market is probably one of the best irrigation delivery systems that you can get full strength sodium hypochlorite to the apex without the risk or minimizing the risk of it going past the apex and a continuous flow of it as well. So fresh hypochlorite to the apex, so you're removing the tissue, you're removing the bacteria. So whether it's a vital case or a non-vital case, I'm satisfied and confident that I'm getting a clean root canal and I'm confident that I can seal that and obturate it in one visit. Now, why are they being done in two visits? Well, time factor as well. You get a young guy or gal out of school. Difficult to do a four canal molar in an hour, right? You get a guy like me or my colleagues who've been out for 30 years and this is all we do all day. And I'd say probably 50,000 root canals in my career or 50, more. 50,000? I would say if I do anywhere between 15 and 1,800 root canals a year times 30, what does that come out to be? About 50,000 plus, right? Over wow. my lifetime, over 30 years, you know? You do 1,500, 1,800 a year? I do now probably about 1,500, but you know, when I was younger, I was doing 1,800, some years more. You know, working six days a week as a young guy. Yep. Right, paying those bills, paying off the loans. Yep, paying right. for those children, I Ryan. understand, <laughs> right? Paying for those kids. Um, Still paying for those kids. There seems to be, two different types of endodontist. One is an apical barbarian who loves to, to make sure they get all the way to the bottom. They always want to puff a sealer out the end. Right. And then there's these pulp lovers who want to stop a half millimeter short and make it all pretty at the end. Would you call yourself an apical barbarian or a pulp lover? I would say I am a, uh, I love that. Cliff Ruddle coined that term, didn't he? Apical yeah. barbarian. He's a good friend. Uh, I would say I'm somewhere in between. I like to get. Oh, I like on, to get gotta, I'm not committed. You got to be Conan no the way, Barbarian man. or the little. No, you don't. Know, you could be somewhere <laughs> in between. I like to. I like to get to the apical terminus. I believe in apical patency. I like to make sure that my apical terminus is patent. I'll make sure that I can get an 08 or an 08 hand file wherever I possibly can, 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters past the apical terminus for the reason that I want to get that dent and debris. I want to make sure that I don't compact it. I want to make sure it stays in suspension. I want to make sure we evacuate it out coronally. And by maintaining apical patency, call me an apical barbarian if you will. <laughs> <laughs> but apical, I'm not taking a 35 hand file past the apical constriction. I'm talking a small 08, 06 hand file. 
So I'm a mild barbarian. On that on that evacuation system, what was it called? It's called the Endovac. And the Endovac. How large would it have to be filed out to get that all the way to? You need to be able to get a 35 to work in length. Okay. Because the diameter of that micro cannula is 0.32 millimeters. So Ryan, how many countries are we in now on uh, iTunes? 154. And uh, um, we're North America, US and Canada. A lot of dentists around the world, um, especially in Asia, um, will say things like, um, well, you Americans, you, you only use bleach. And bleach only kills one type of bug. And we like to, after we do the bleach, we like to use um, hydrogen peroxide for the gram-negative anaerobes. And then we like to use chlorhexidine gluconate for this. And they they use like four different kinds. They, they like to go through bleach, then they like to go through paradox, and they like to go to um, um, the hydrogen peroxide. Um, how many irrigants do you use? Do you need to use two or three or four? Based on the research that I'm aware of, and I know a lot of research, two irrigants. Full strength sodium hypochlorite and 17% aqueous EDTA. Sodium hypochlorite is going to be enough to get rid of the bugs, any bugs that are in that root canal system. It's going to remove the organic tissue. It's going to remove the organic component of the smear layer, that organic, inorganic layer that's created on the wall of the root canal. The EDTA is going to take care of the inorganic component because we've got to remove that smear layer. The sodium hypochlorite is going to remove the biofilm, that buccal polysaccharide matrix in which those nasty bacteria are hiding behind and within. And that's all you really need. Some docs like to use an intracanal medicament of calcium hydroxide, but there's some bad actors out there in the bacteria world. One of those bad actors is E. Fecalis. We see those in post-treatment disease cases. Cases that have already been treated that we're going to retreat. And E. Fecalis thrives in calcium hydroxide. Thrives in calcium hydroxide. So we're falling into a little bit of a false sense of security thinking that the calcium hydroxide is going to get rid of all the bugs. And that's why we should do root canal in two appointments. Or three appointments if there's not enough time to do it in two appointments. Um, but sodium hypochlorite and 70% EDTA. Chlorhexidine, excellent irrigant, kills bacteria, probably on the same level as sodium hypochlorite, but it doesn't do anything to the biofilm, doesn't dissolve tissue at all. So, and you gotta be careful too, because some docs like to use both, right? They like to use sodium hypochlorite, they like to follow that up with chlorhexidine, but you don't wanna mix the two. Because if you mix the two, not only will you get this reddish brown gunk precipitate, which can, now you gotta clean that out of the root canal, but you also get a, by, a byproduct called perichloroaniline. And perichloroaniline, one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto, Bettina Basrani, has found that perichloroaniline not only is it toxic, but it can be carcinogenic. So you wanna make sure you don't mix the two together. If you're gonna use sodium hypochlorite and you're gonna follow that off with chlorhexidine, you wanna make sure that you rinse out one really well before you use the next. They're drying out a molar. They're using paper points. They're getting ready to fill, but of those three canals, one of them just won't really get dry. Is that really a big deal? I mean, can you, do you need all three canals dry? What, what do you do when you just keep having one canal? It just doesn't get dry. So are you talking bleeding or are you talking like a sopping wet paper point? You tell me, does it matter? It does matter. <laughs> okay. It does matter. Bleeding we can control. Sometimes, you know, and everyone's experienced this, I know, because if I have experienced, everyone's experienced. You clean your root canal, you finish your irrigation, everything's going great, you're in endodontic nirvana. Couldn't be going better, you found seven canals, your system's yeah. passing things, you got an endo ballet happening, and you dry all four, five, six canals, and all of a sudden one starts to seep. It's like old yeller, right? You got a, oh no, right? You got a bleeding canal, now what do you do? Patients are waiting, you figure it, oh, I didn't factor in for a bleeding canal, right? So you gotta stop the bleeding, what do you do? Sodium hypochlorite is hemostatic. Go back in, redo your irrigation protocol. If that doesn't work, then what I'll do is I'll dip a paper point in, a, in some ferric sulfate. It's a great hemostatic agent. Ferric sulfate's like a styptic. You cut yourself shaving, you put a styptic pencil on, right? Causes a, um, protein precipitate, a mechanical obstruction to hemorrhage. So 
take a paper point, dip it in some ferric sulfate. Stringent, stringent is very good. I use the brand Cutrol, C-U-T-T-R-O-L. You dial 1-800-CUTROL. Where are they out of? Mobile, Alabama. Mobile, Alabama. I think the company's called Ichthys, if I pronounced it correctly. Yeah, what did that stand for? Is that the city? It's, it's in Mobile, Alabama, but you know. Ichthys is the company. Yeah. And Cutrol, C-U-T-T-R-O-L, is the manufacturer that I, that I, these the type that I use. Dip my paper point in Cutrol, put it right to working length, leave it in for a few seconds, pull it out. It forms this black, gunky precipitate, but it stops the bleeding. You go back in, you repeat your final irrigation protocol, you watch your length, because chances are when you went in with that paper point, you probably hit a, a, a vessel, right? Just be, have good length control. And then you can uh, then dry them and you're ready to go. Now, if I got a canal that's weeping, right? Or if I got a canal that has pus coming out of it, there's no way I'm gonna fill that case. I'll put calcium hydroxide in, because calcium hydroxide will help that weeping canal and bring them back in a week and then repeat my irrigation protocol and then obturate. Um, I'm just going to keep going through the list. There's so sure. many sealers on the market. And sealers have been... When, when when you and I got out of school, the big one was Grossman cement. Sure. And now they're starting to come out with like resin cements. I mean, there's, oh, there's so many... There's many different classifications of cements. Um, what, what would you say if she said, what kind of sealer should I use? It's a great question. Grossman, zinc oxide, eugenol sealer, Kerr pulp canal sealer, zinc oxide, eugenol sealer, the... Trend now is going towards bioactive sealers. Calcium silicates, for instance, MTA is a calcium silicate. Biodentine is a calcium silicate. They're bioactive. So now you're gonna be seeing companies, Brassler has been the first who's come out with their bioceramic sealer. It's a calcium silicate. It induces healing. It's bioactive, so it recruits the cells in order to heal around. And that's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see more bioactive sealers. The issue with some bioactive sealers is that they are heat sensitive and they may you know, degrade in the presence of heat. So and I believe they're working on sealers that will be more stable in heat for those that wanna use a warm vertical gutta percha technique to seal off their root canals. And what is your gutta percha technique? Is it lateral condensation, vertical condensation? Do you own a hot gutta percha glue gun? Absolutely, I own every single brand of hot gutta percha <laughs> glue, glue gun. I have the Elements Free, I have the Optura, I've got b &L, I got the Hot Shot, I got them all, man. I got a museum of all the instruments I used to use. I'm sure you've seen that as well. So uh, yeah, I use a warm vertical technique. I use a continuous wave of condensation technique. I fit a cone, I sear off that cone, I do a down pack, sear off the apical one third, and then I do a backfill. A lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of people, this is kind of a controversial question, uh, but they um, they say, I feel like these um, hot gutta perches on a stick, like a thermophil, I, I feel it just faster and easier. But I kind of feel like, I don't know if my endodontist wants me to do this. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on the hot gutta perch on a stick uh, brands? So we're talking about carriers. Carriers. And uh, I mean, I have, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty partial to, to not using them because I'm the one that's got to retreat them. And I don't find them particularly easy to remove or retreat. Problem with some dentists who use carriers, because I believe carriers are very effective if you clean and shape the root canal properly. And that's it. You got to shape it. You got to clean it. I know a lot of dentists will use a carrier and hope for success based on the carrier. So they don't clean the canal properly, they don't shape the canal properly, they put the carrier in, all the gutta percha gets stripped off and all you got is a carrier and an unclean canal. So is it the carrier or is it the unclean canal? I think it's the unclean canal and the inadequate shape in order to use the carrier first. So shape that canal, clean it. You know, there's the old saying, it's more important what you take out than what you put in. I do believe it's important what you put in because you need to seal off that root canal system to prevent leakage from coming into that tooth. But as long as you do your root canal treatment properly and you use the carriers properly, I think they're effective techniques. Saying that, I'm always most amazed that whenever you find two dentists talking on dental uh, root canals, they're always talking about obturation and sealers and all that kind of stuff. And you just said it, successful endos is more about 
what you took out. You got rid of all the infection, not what you put in, sealer and gutta percha. But don't you think more dentists are obsessed with the obturation and the sealer instead of cleaning and shaping? Well, when, when you evaluate, that's a great question. When, when dentists evaluate the quality of the root canal that's treated, they look at the x-ray and they go, wow, that's a beautiful root canal. Look how well obturated that is. They found four canals. They got right to the apex, nice homogeneous fill, right to the orifice, the restoration's nice. But what you can't see on an x-ray is how was that root canal cleaned? Did the dentist use sodium hypochlorite? Did they use EDTA? Did they use their own saliva, right? Did they lick the files before they put them in the canals? Who knows, you can't see that on a radiograph. All you can see is what the obturation looks like. And that's one of the problems with assessing root canal treatments. We know the patient's not in pain, we know there's no apical periodontitis, and the root canal looks good, we got success. But when a case fails and you look at the radiograph, you go, why did that fail? It looks so good on the radiograph. Maybe they missed a canal. Maybe they didn't use ultrasonics. Maybe they didn't use sodium hypochlorite. Maybe they didn't get to the apex with their irrigant or their canal and they got lucky with the obturation. Who knows, right? It's a dark hole we're working in, Howard. We don't you, know. You're right. You know what I did? to make my endo better than anything I ever did in my entire life. I learned how to Photoshop those digital x-rays. <laughs> That's funny. I just paint <laughs> in, uh, they look so pretty. I spent five minutes Photoshopping all my final videos. There you go. True or false, the number one cause of a failed molar root canal is a missed canal. <clears throat> you know what, that's a hard question to answer. I would say probably <clears throat> One of the reasons that root canal treatment fails is because of an untreated canal. One of the reasons. If there's bacteria in there and it leaks out the end, then certainly you can get failure. There's a lot of moving parts. When you look at successful endodontics, number one, you need to find all the canals. Absolutely, 100%. Number two, you need to get down to the apical terminus. Number three, you need to remove the smear layer, the biofilm, right? You need to obturate in three dimensions. Now. You may not find a canal in one patient and it succeeds, and you may not find a root canal in another patient and it may not succeed, right? We're dealing with the human variable as well. So hard to say if the number one failure reason is of, of a missed canal. I would say that's one of the reasons. Um, it seems like insurance data would suggest that the number one failed root canal is a maxillary first molar. Would you agree with that? I would definitely agree. I see that in my practice. You know, maxillary first molar, why did it fail? Most likely because the MB2 canal wasn't found. That's what I see personally. Interesting that you said that. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, well, if the number one failed root canal, according to insurance data, is a maxillary first molar, if you're saying you see that, the insurance companies say they see that, are you starting to think that maybe the standard of care is a three-dimensional CBCT x-ray when you're doing endo on a first molar, max ray first molar, or is that overkill? You know what? Great question. You know, there's a position paper that was just recently released, a combination of the American Association of Endodontists and the American Association of Maxillofacial Radiologists. And their position paper basically said that CBCTs are standard of care for any tooth that has complex anatomy. And they define complex anatomy as any tooth in the oral cavity except the maxillary anterior. Is it overkill? You know what? I don't know. I don't know. Really depends on the radiation dose. And we have small field of view now. And if we can maximize our success rate by getting a roadmap of where to look i would love to take a cbct on every tooth that i was doing root canal on so back to your practice if you did a hundred root canals what percent of them would you get a three-dimensional cbct x-ray on okay in my practice and i can't speak for every endodontist but in my practice i'd say about 80 percent of what i do are retreatments or cases that have had post-treatment disease i won't call them failed root canals because it's important to figure it's somebody I would say post-treatment disease, where root canal's already been treated, they come in with apical periodontitis, a lesion of endodontic origin, it may be symptomatic, it may be asymptomatic, and I'm called upon to treat that case. 
maxillary molar, case that's already been treated, I will take a CBCT 100% of the time. It's funny, so you say 80% of your practice is retreatment. Correct. But when I go meet every general dentist, I say, in the last 30 years, how many of your root canals have failed? And they always say, well, knock on wood, hasn't happened yet. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm pretty lucky. I mean, I swear, the general dentist, they'll say, well, how many have failed in your lifetime? How many fail every decade? I, I, one maybe. And then I go talk to the endodontist in the same building, right. and he says, 80% of my practice is retreats. Retreats. Why do, so are you mostly treating immigrants that have moved into Toronto <laughs> from other countries? None so of my practice. Obviously, pra none of the Canadian general dentists have ever had a failed root canal. None of my practice. No, I'd say, <laughs> that's a funny question. <laughs> no, I'd say, you know, I got quite a few immigrants that have come over and have had root canals done from Eastern Bloc countries, Asia as well, where they just slap in things at the time from years ago. Uh, but I'd say most of my practice are from patients that are born and raised in the in the area. And uh, for those dentists that are saying, wow, I haven't had any failures, either patients aren't coming back, right? They don't know about it, or they're lying. Yeah, yeah. Cause that's it, you do root canal, you're gonna get failures. Listen, I get failures too. I separate instruments, I perforate, you know, fortunately not often. But it happens. This is a very weird and bizarre question, but I, I want you to focus on a young kid coming out of school. Which tooth is the most likely to be a hell of a lot harder than it looks? So when you're saying learning into, you're, you know, starting easy cases, be predictable, what do you think they think, oh, this will be, th th this will be good, I got this, this will be easy, but it's harder than it looks. Because sometimes they, they look at x-ray and like if they see the, is it the, can, the the nerve canal disappears? Well, you know, what 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 do you think a 25 year old mind should be looking for? That little birdie on the shoulder saying, nah, that's a red flag. What are red flags to say in your first hundred root canals that maybe this one's gonna be harder than it looks? Well, if you're looking at the x-ray radiograph, look and see if the root canal looks calcified. You know, know your anatomy, that's the key. I find that a lot of young guys don't know their anatomy. In fact, lower premolars, 25% of lower premolars or more have that lingual canal. It's not even looked for, it's not even thought of, right? So when I go into a lower premolar, at least 25% of them will have that lingual canal that goes untreated. Lower anterior teeth, where you think it's a slam dunk, over 50% of those lower anterior teeth have two canals have knowledge of it, look for it, and appreciate and recognize that the anatomy may be more complicated than you think. So if there's one tooth, hard to say. Other than maxillary anterior teeth, which can be complicated as well, every tooth has potential to be complicated with complex anatomy. This is a very common question on Dental Town. Um, obviously the pain is in this quadrant. I know it's in this quadrant. I just can't tell. I've got it down to two teeth. How often is it two teeth, or how often is it they, they're not doing something right diagnostically to find the tooth? That's a great question because it's uncommon. Unless two teeth had similar fillings done at the same time, it's uncommon for more than one tooth to be acting up and causing that tooth pain and that toothache. Number one, you gotta go through your systematic diagnostic protocol absolutely 100% of the time, whether you think it's obvious or not. Patient comes in with pain, lower right quadrant, you take an x-ray, you see that lower first molar has got a huge radiolucency. Don't assume that that's the tooth that's causing the pain. Going through your systematic diagnostic protocol means there's the mnemonic, SOAP, S-O-A-P. Got to go through your subjective exam. Question the patient. I believe that probably 80% of all endodontic diagnoses can be made by just talking to the patient and listening to the patient. We're all too quick to lean that patient back and start tapping on teeth. So, subjective examination followed by the objective examination. Going through your pulp tests, tooth by tooth. Not only adjacent teeth to where you think the problem is, but go to the opposing arch as well. Find out what's normal for that patient. Look at all the different teeth, examine them. Cold tests, percussion, bite test, apical palpation, periodontal probing. Once you've done that and your subjective examination, then you go to the A of the SOAP. You go to assessing all the information that you've got 
and then you plan for treatment. If you can't make a diagnosis, if you can't make a diagnosis, the standard of practice is not to treat. Just don't treat, bring them back, give them an NSAID. Bring them back in a week and redo your test. Now that you have a baseline of where you are at this particular moment, next week things may change. Maybe that tooth that responded normal to cold doesn't respond to normal to cold the next week and maybe that's the tooth that's caused the, caused the discomfort. So the standard of practice is if you can't localize, don't treat. Chances are that not two teeth are acting up at the same time. Right, well, you know what, Mrs. Mrs. X, I think it's this tooth, but you may also have a problem on this tooth as well. That's the insurance policy that some dentists do. So they do the treatment, patient still has the pain, they come back, you know what, doc, I still have that pain. Well, you know what, it's that other tooth as well, we're gonna treat that one too, and voila, the pain goes away. Perhaps it was a misdiagnosis, right? So if you can't localize, bring them back. Give them your cell number, give them your email address, tell them, you know what, Mrs. B, I'm available 24-7 for you. You call me anytime and we'll bring you back. That's what we do in our practice. <clears throat> this is a very unfair question for you because you're not seeing the x-ray. But a lot of times they're looking at this tooth and it's had a root canal. And they're looking at this tooth saying, do I want her to spend $1,000 and retreat the root canal? Or should I pull this tooth and go straight to an implant? And then the implant companies, I mean, they get... The marketing departments get pretty crazy with, oh, we have a 96% success rate. And then they're saying, well, what's the success rate of a retreat? And again, it's totally unfair because you're not seeing the root canal. But what, what, what would you say they should think about when they're thinking, should I send this to an endodontist and retreat or should I just go straight to the periodontist or oral surgeon and go to titanium? You're talking about a general dentist? Yeah. I think you should give the patient the option in all fairness to the patient. You know what, Mrs. B? Mrs. B is our favorite patient, by the way. Mrs. I think you B. Should, I think you should That's go see. I think you should go see <laughs> Dr. G because I think you should get another opinion. This case has been treated. You know, look at the tooth as a whole. Is it restorable? If the answer is yes, what's the perio like? The perio is decent, right? The root canal has not worked. Got post-treatment disease. You've got the option now: take the tooth out, put an implant in, or let's send it to an endodontist that may have an opportunity to retreat this case and get success and you have the option of keeping what nature has created. And if it doesn't work, you always have that option of taking it out and putting an implant in. But once you take it out, it's out, it's done. Place the implant in, yes, it has a high degree of success, but we're working on the human body. Not everything works 100% of the time. There is a chance that implant may not work, and then you gotta get another one future, down in the future in your lifetime. So dentistry really is all about prevention of oral disease and Retain the natural dentition wherever you possibly can. Give the patient the option. Tell them the pros and cons. And then try to guide that patient into the right decision. Would you say it's fair to say that a lot of these implant success rates that implant companies are touting on their full page ads are a little exaggerated or cherry picking greater studies? It seems like a lot of, a lot of younger people really believe that these implants are 90, six ninety seven percent successful do you really believe that i think they're a hundred percent successful when they work <laughs> 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 and of course they're zero percent success when they don't work you know every patient's different and you know what i can't even answer that question with with certainty because you know like endo there's a lot of moving parts with implants too you got to make sure the quality of bone is there the quantity of bone is there you got to make sure there's no systemic problems Want to make sure the patient's not on bisphosphonates, of course. You want to make sure that when that hole is drilled for that implant, that it's done underwater cooling, that it's done properly, that the implant is placed properly, that everything is done as aseptic as possible. So if any one of those situations is broken, you may get you know, a roadmap for failure, which is quite possible. So you know what, I can't even entertain that question because my biggest, my biggest comment to you will be, I don't know. A lot of people are always posting a question on Dental Town, uh, an X-ray, and they'll say, "Is this internal resorption or external resorption?" So my question is, how is it external resorption, internal resorption, and does it matter in what you're doing? Oh, it matters big time, and that's probably one of my biggest, greatest uses of the comb beam. 
you know, before we had the cone beam and a patient came in with resorption and we were trying to decide is it internal or is it external, we used to take, you know, off angle x rays and, you know, if the resorption moved when we took an off angle x ray, then it was external. And if it didn't move and it followed the root canal space, it was internal. And we weren't sure of the extent of it or nor the exact location of it. So often we would go in blind, right? But now we know for certainty. If patient comes in with, his, with resorption, I will definitely order a cone beam right away because with certainty we know if it's internal external combination of both we know the exact location of it and the extent of it and then we can deal with how to treat it whether we're going to treat it or whether we're going to recommend that we remove it and replace it with an implant bridge removable appliance of some kind and what would you rather have internal or external resorption i would rather if i had a choice i'd yeah. rather have neither <laughs> but i'd rather have it's like, we, what kind of heart attack you want? Oh, I'll have a mild one, please. <laughs> um, sort of pregnant or not pregnant? Internal resorption, that's treatable, obviously. Internal resorption, that, that it's not too extensive, where we can get rid of that by doing root canal treatment and treat it properly. Because once you have external resorption, <laughs> chances of, uh, of, uh, of success are a lot less. When I got out of school, I was so young, dumb, broken, poor that the only really continued educa education I could afford was going across the street and asking my endodontist if I could be his assistant on the afternoons I had no patients, same with the oral surgeon, and um, they just said, sure. A lot of, a lot of these uh, millennials say, well, you know, Gary's not gonna let me go assist him because he doesn't want me to learn endo. He wants me to refer it all to him the only way I can learn endo is to get on an airplane and fly to a different city and go to a convention or a course or hands-on because he's making money by me going to his course or his hands-on lecture or whatever. What would you say to a millennial if they, if, um, what, what do you think, there's 4,000 endodontists in the United States. Do you know how many are in, in the world or? No idea. So there's 4,000 in the United States. What percent of those 4,000 endodontists of a young millennial said, hey, I don't have any patients on Thursday afternoon. Can I come watch you do some molars? What percent of those endodontists say, hell yeah, I want you to do better endo, thinking hope, growth, and abundance there. I want to meet you, have a relationship, be your buddy, versus thinking fear and scarcity and saying, hell no, I'm not teaching you the secrets to endo. Just give it all to me. <laughs> I think one of the biggest criticisms that I got from the local endodontist 30 years ago when I started continuing education was, why do you want to teach dentists how to do root canal? And I said, well, you want to teach them how to do root canal because they're going to do it anyways. But if they're going to do it anyways, let's teach them how to do it properly. And they'll figure out on their own the cases they can handle and the cases they can't handle. Right? I welcome dentists to come into my office and shadow me. I have at least one dentist come in weekly. You know, ones that have taken my courses, ones that are down the street, ones that are out of town. I welcome them to come in, watch us do things. Watch us how we do root canal treatment because I want them to do it better and I want them to treat their patients in their patient's best interest. And if they feel they can't handle it, then they'll know. I mean, there's some dentists that take my course and, you know, they'll end up doing every root canal that comes their way and I get some dentists to take my course and go, damn, I'm not gonna do another root canal in my life. I see what it takes to do a proper root canal and I see what it takes to achieve success. So you're gonna have a whole ri whole range of docs that are gonna do that. But I welcome dentists in my office every single day. And I think that someone who doesn't is just being selfish. For, for me, it was great because I don't wanna learn how to um, place an implant or do a root canal and have somebody on the other side of the country. I'd rather have a root canal go south and be able to call my buddy that I've been in his office five times and say, you know, can you help me out? You know what sure. I mean? I, I would just rather have the relationship with, I, I'd rather know an endodontist in my zip code than across the country. Uh, you're from Canada, so I'll throw you under a bus for this. A lot of them are so worried about septicane. Isn't that from Canada? Articane? Articane. There's Articane. And, and some of these people, they'll, they'll point to a study and say, well, septicane, if, if you're going to do a root canal with septicane, you hit that inferior of a nerve, it'll, it'll, it's more likely to be a paresthesia. Then other people say, no, that's not true at all. You're looking at one study. Do you ever use Septicane, which in Canada is called Articane? Correct. Ultracane. Ultracane? Ultracane, yeah. But Articane. in the United States, it's Septicane. And it's available in the U.S. now, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of controversy with respect to using it for mandibular blocks, right? 
Um, I speak to my local anesthesiologists and we look at the studies, there's a lot of controversy regarding that. But from what I understand, it's not the articane hydrochloric per se, but it's the concentration of the anesthetic being the 4%, which apparently, and again, there's controversy with regards to that as well. Whether it's the 4%, site and nest plane comes in 4%. Articane hydrochloride is 4%. So there's some thinking that maybe it's the 4% that may be contributing to the paresthesias that everyone's worried about and talking about. Or maybe it's just trauma to the nerve. So it's hard to say where that's coming from. Do I use it personally for my mandibular blocks or my gal gates? No, I don't. I use a combination of lidocaine hydrochloride and based on the recent research, I, I chase that with carbocaine, no epinephrine. And I'm having great success rates with my mandibular blocks. I will follow that up with a buccal infiltration of articane hydrochloride. Based on the latest research that's come out with anesthesia. Um, young endodontists often wonder this. If if I send you a molar root canal that's failed, or what do you say, it's continuing pathology? Uh, post-treatment disease. It has post-treatment disease. Some of these millennials are saying, well, if the only way you can feed your three children is to do the retreat, would you really give objective advice that, yeah, this needs to be retreat versus, no, this needs to track and go to an implant versus an endodontist who could feed his family either way. I said, I could charge you a thousand and do the retreat. I could charge you a thousand, pull the tooth and do an implant. Do you think that is overly simplistic or do you think the most objective endodontist of tomorrow will be able to do both treatments so that there's no economic advantage or disadvantage to what they say? You mean the endodontist that does implants? The, the endodontist, yeah. I think that, I mean, I'll speak for myself. As a youngster, I would do what is ethically and responsible and give the patient the alternatives. You know, if I felt that I could retreat that case with reasonable success, I would retreat me because I that's what I would want for myself. But if I felt that I couldn't retreat it adequately, then I would be honest with that patient. I think you should have that tooth taken out. But would all one. four thousand dentists be that ethical? All four thousand endodontists in the United States and Canada be that ethical? Or do you think or do you think there'll be pressures to endodontists that they'll have to demonstrate their referrals. Look, I, I'll always do the right thing because I'm going to make $1,000 either way. Retreat and implant, I don't care. I can do both. Or do you think that's overly simplistic? I think it's overly simplistic. Yeah. I would well, hope I would hope that all specialists, all dentists would, would be ethical with respect to what they wanted to do and obviously provide the best treatment possible for the patient and give them the alternatives and guide them towards the, the proper treatment. If you had to guess, what percent of endodontists place implants today? And what do you think it was 10 years ago? And what do you think it'll be 10 years from now? I don't know the number, Howard, but I think a lot more endodontists are doing it. But I have a deal with my periodontists and oral surgeons in my, in my city. They don't do the endo, I don't do the implant. And I would like to think that, you know, it's great that endodontists are doing implants, but I want to. I went into endo to become an expert in one thing, and that's endodontics. And I still feel that way. I want to become the best I can be at endo, and I'm continually learning, even 30 years later. And you know, if we can disinfect that root canal system and save that tooth, that's what I want to concentrate on. I'm not uh, criticizing any endodontists that are doing implants because I think that's fantastic. And if they can build up the referral base to do that, and that's part of their practice then uh, the power would be with them. But I'll only speak personally for myself, and I wanna be good at one thing, and that's doing root canal treatment. And if I can't do it, and an implant needs to be done, I wanna send it to the expert. I wanna send it to the dentist, the periodontist, oral surgeon that's doing it all day long. Right, just, I'm looking at myself, it was my tooth. Who would I want that implant to be placed by? I want it to be placed by Dr. Lenga down the street, or Dr. David up the road, because I know they're experts in implants. And that's who I want placed in my implant. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, two more questions. What would you say if she's she's listening right now and she's a junior or senior in dental school? And she's thinking, I, I'm not sure if, I, I'm thinking I might want to go to grad school and be an endodontist. And she said to you, what, what do you think of going to grad school and being an endodontist in 2017? Good idea, bad idea? Would you do it again? 
What, what, what do you think of that idea in 2017? I think it's great. I would tell her, follow your path, do what you love to do and do what you enjoy. Be good at what you do, make sure you're the best that you can be and the money will come. And last question, and again, thank you after lecturing all day to spend <laughs> time with my homies. Um, you put a course on Dental Town, the Endodontic Restorative Continuum, a blueprint for success. Um, it's an hour and a half long. Everybody I know loves it. Everybody on the message board is saying it's amazing. Um, tell them about your course. What would they learn on your uh, one and a half hour course on Dental Town? My one and a half hour course in Dental Town will discuss many things. Number one, it'll talk about what it takes to do a good root canal. What's the criteria? for six, successful root canal treatment. Number one, you gotta make access. Number two, we gotta find the canals, as I mentioned. You've gotta get rid of the smear layer, the biofilm, obturate the root canal system in three dimensions, and you gotta restore that tooth in a timely and effective way. Because no matter what you do in those previous steps, if you don't restore that tooth timely, you don't restore that tooth effectively, and you get coronal leakage, you have the potential for failure. And during that webinar, during that continuing education, one hour, one and a half hours, you're gonna learn what it takes to do a good root canal, and you're gonna learn, based on the science, the reason why we need to restore that tooth timely and effectively. Sorry, I gotta ask one more overtime question I forgot to ask. Sure. <clears throat> There's a um, very huge holistic uh, doctor out there, I don't wanna mention his name, because it might get back to Dr. Mercola. <laughs> who just keeps publishing article after article after article that when you do a root canal, where the root canal ends and the body starts, there's this continuous infection, infection. You've seen these articles. What do 98% of cancer patients all have in common? They had a root canal. And, and, and it's not that whether you believe in it or not or this or that. We have patients on the front line coming in with printed out Mercola reports that 98% of everyone that had cancer had this in their body, a root canal. Um, holistic dentists <clears throat> in all the major metros in America have holistic dentists that are extracting all the root canal teeth. That's a shame. Well, it, what, would you, what, would you, what would you say to that? You know, that focal infection theory uh, rears its ugly head every few years, and that's based on contaminated, faulty studies done in the 1930s by Dr. Weston Price. And I encourage every patient who is grasping for straws, for whatever chronic illness they have, not to focus in on their teeth. Certainly, good gum, good uh, oral hygiene is important, making sure that you don't have periodontal disease, making sure that if you do have infection and root canal treated teeth, that you take care of it, whether you decide to retreat it, do apical surgery, or take it out. But we look at the myths, and no better website to go to than the AAE website, American Association of Anodontic website, aae.org. Go into that website, go to the search, search in myths, M-Y-T-H-S, and you'll come up with three myths. One of those myths is that root canals cause chronic disease because the bacteria are continually leaching out and going to distant organs and causing multiple sclerosis, cancer, and a whole host of other horrible diseases. And the focal infection theory has been disproved over and over again. One of my icons and heroes in Toronto is Dr. Cal Tornick, who disproved it as well. So I encourage them to go onto the AAE website, aae.org, go to the myths, and you can print out a whole list of references that refute this focal infection theory. And it really irks me to fall on patients' fears of extracting teeth in the hope that they'll get better. And Does that answer your question? Yeah, and speaking of websites, what would they find at your website, drgaryglassman.com? Well, my website can be quite entertaining. And uh, what I encourage everybody to do is go to my website, drgaryglassman.com, and take that oral fitness test to see how orally fit you are, to see how educated you are with respect to your oral fitness, and also encourage your patients to go on it as well. Because 
oral health, oral fitness is so important. It's as important as exercising every day because our mouths and our oral cavity is the gateway to the rest of our body. And we gotta stay healthy, not only orally, but also physically as well. Wow, that was an hour and one minute. That was the fastest hour I think I've ever done a podcast in my life. Seriously, <laughs> Gary, um, thank you so much. I can't believe after a long day, you uh, would do this for my homies and uh, it was an amazing hour. Uh, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Thank you for all the root canals you've ever done. Thank you for making that online C course. You gotta watch it. It's, it's, it's an amazing course. Thank, thank you, you so much for coming well, on the Howard, show. Well, it was great finally meeting you in person. And thanks for having me. Oh, it was an honor.